everybody. So I'm so excited today to be here for another episode of Obscure Animation. And this month we are talking about an anime film uh, called In This Corner of the World. It came out last year in the United States. And uh, I'm really excited to dive into it. It's a very unique film. And uh, Stanford, thanks so much. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah. So this movie, I had the opportunity to interview the director and so I feel almost like I have a, it was such an amazing interview and he was so, he gave so much insight and it was so personal that I felt, I feel almost like I have sort of a personal connection to the movie. Oh, absolutely. That and was so cool. You got to interview him, Rachel. It was so cool. And one of the best interviews I think I've done, especially considering there was a translator, the fact that, I don't know, it was the fact that it could be so in depth and so it was really amazing. And, uh, and you know, it's interesting because when I first saw it, I was maybe a little bit, I don't know, there's something about when you have like a personal connection with a movie, I almost am trying to be a tiny bit more critical because I want to make sure that I'm being objective, if that makes sense. Yes, absolutely. And, uh, and this movie is definitely not for everybody, but I have to say, Watching it again this last week, I just thought it was so beautiful. And I think I liked it even more than, <laughs> than I did last yeah. year. It was so beautiful. And uh, I don't know. What did you think? I thought it was beautiful, too. Yeah. It Oh, good. It really opened my eyes again to an interesting time period, you know, set in, in kind of pre-World War II and then World War II yeah. in a more rural part of Japan. And I so... Again, in some way, even though, I mean, I know it's animated, but I was viewing it as almost like a history lesson. Yeah. And I just love the hand-drawn animation and and uh, really, really found it to be uh, an interesting film. I mean, it's a challenging film to watch. Yeah, it because is. Because hard things yeah. are happening, but that doesn't mean to shy away from it, you know. It's just yeah. to think be aware of it, but, but, but I, yeah, I enjoyed it. Yay, I'm so glad. Yeah, this film, if you don't like slice of life, following people around stories that don't have a ton of plot, there is plot in here, but uh, but they spend a lot of time with ordinary activities intentionally uh, to give you a feel for the life of these characters and life of these people. There's long montages where they're just making rice and things like that. And that's going to be boring to some people. And so it's definitely not for everybody, but I really loved those details. I thought it was so interesting. Oh, I, didn't I thought that's what made the film. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Well, I'm really excited to hear that. Uh, it's directed by Su Sunoa Katabuchi. Sorry, I'm probably saying that terrible. Uh, <laughs> Better than I could do. <laughs> I was going to ask you how do you how do you pronounce his name? <laughs> yeah, and he is an incredible animator. And he before this had done a movie called My My Miracle, which got quite a bit of acclaim. I've actually haven't seen it, but he worked as an assistant director on uh, Kiki's Delivery Service. Yeah, was his first big job and it was amazing the amount of effort and research and things that they did in order to make this movie and uh, I asked him I said I noticed the great attention to detail that you had of everyday life during the war in Japan and he talks about the research he did and he said uh, he talked about the bookshelves of books and that they bought for research for the movie uh, many, many, many bookshelves that they got. And uh, he said, I really had to think about every aspect of daily life that needed to be researched. What material was the clothing made of? What color was it? At that time, there was no silk. So what were they using instead? How were they doing laundry, toothpaste, toothbrushes? So that's yeah. the level of research we've been, we've been doing. Used books, libraries. And he says, I have a friend who's a collector of vintage magazines. And so I had them to look at uh, magazines from that era and look at what kind of articles are in there. So we use many different kinds of resources to research and then writings from that time, government, military records, and personal journals, all of these together to create the film. And I think you can really feel that level of like Absolutely. gritty getting down to like, what kind of toothpaste were they using? Yeah. I mean, that's amazing. Yeah. It is. It's amazing. Again, I'm not. I'm no expert at all on that. You know, and that with that subject matter. But as I said, I really felt like I was learning a lot of what life must have been like. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. And so, well, let's kind of dive in. So the main story you, you, it focuses on the, the movie focuses on this girl named Suzu, uh, who lives in Hiroshima during World War II. And she starts out, she's 18, I believe, 17 or 18. And uh, yeah, she's, the yeah. first part of it, she's even a little younger, but we were introduced Ooh, to yeah, her. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> there is that montage at the beginning showing her yeah. drawing and showing as a girl, interacting with her family in, yeah. in the city in Hiroshima. Well, pretty early on, uh, she gets matched with a man uh, named Shus- Shusaka, who she mm-hmm. briefly had met as a little girl in that opening sequence. Yeah, in that opening sequence. Yeah. And not, of course, not knowing who he was. And he lives in Kure City. Outside of, of, of Hiroshima, right? That's, yeah, I think so. It's considered as part of the Hiroshima like province, I think. Yeah. It's located within one hour by a local train. And you also see briefly, this, she has this sort of childhood crush on this character named Tetsu, who kind of becomes a, a, important later on. Yeah. And how did you feel about this whole sort of arranged marriage and how they kind of handled it? That's such a, you know, again, such an interesting topic. I know that's, that's the society of the, of the time period. I don't know if everybody was practicing that, but it just always just seems so interesting to me that that happens. I thought that the, this film handled it in a really nice manner and that, mm-hmm. I mean, I guess you should say a very uh, uh, emotionally authentic manner. Yeah. Of what that- it must feel like to go through that's exactly the word that i have in my notes i said it feels very authentic and it feels like they're not trying to score modern points of like look how backward this is they're not trying to also elevate it in any way they're just they're just showing it and yeah it wasn't there's no judgment yes exactly it just it just it just was i mean they just showed it i felt like as it probably was yeah, yeah, and it lets it play out day by day. You really see the growth of both characters of Chef yeah. Taka and Suzu mm-hmm. and how they really do learn to fall in love. And uh, it's it's a definitely a, a, a slow process. It's really quite beautiful, actually. And I, I asked him, I said, with Suzu, she is a very traditional character in a traditional marriage. What do you hope modern viewers take from her story? And he says, first, I want them to understand there are people of different cultures in the world. For Japanese people today, that kind of marriage is not existent. But regardless of that, I feel there are commonalities that even a modern person would have with Suzu. There is a common thread everyone around the world shares with Suzu, even though there are cultural differences, there are also similarities. I feel that is the moment you can go beyond cultural differences, languages, and there are things we all share in common. So that's important to see those differences at the beginning and then to recognize those differences and go beyond to see the areas that were not different. So I, I think that they really did quite a good job with that because uh, you, obviously we can't relate to this situation as you know modern people yeah. that aren't you know, in arranged marriages but we can definitely relate to feelings insecure, feeling awkward, feeling taken advantage of at a time, yeah. new love. All of those emotions are yeah. emotions that anybody can experience. Also, you know, not only is she dealing with this marriage, she's dealing with really a new family environment. Yeah. They're living with his family. She's got to adjust to, you know, her, her mother-in-law and all, and all these other things, which... Again, I thought we're handled in a believable way, you know, and, and nothing too extreme. It just it just felt slice of life. Yeah, they're tough on her, this family, this new family. Yeah. Particularly, I think it's Ky- Kyoko. Yeah, her sister-in-law. Who is kind of bitter. Yeah, her husband and died. There was a store. She had conflict with this other person that ran a neighboring store, but then it ended up just being basically like demolished by, I think, the government or... Yeah. What I, it was a little unclear about exactly what happened, but yeah, it absolutely anyway, a little unclear to me too. But she's, she's bitter. She's bitter about having this new woman coming in, sort of taking over her spot, you know, and marrying one of the sons, and so she's just kind of really tough on her and really difficult. Uh, but I thought that all of the everyday life stuff really works. I thought it was funny at times. It was sweet at times. You know, you were angry at times because the way they were treating her. All of that it 
was just very effective. And you talked about the, the, what they had to do to design clothing, you know, to alter clothing. So it would work, uh, how she had to cook the rice to make it puff up. And they did all of these things, you know, before animating them. So yeah. you, know, you really spend a, quite a long sequence that making the rice. Yeah. I thought it was great. Yeah. That was so interesting to, you know, the whole, yeah. The, the rinsing of the rice and these other things that are, you know, I know just part of cooking and, and yeah, some people could view it as boring and I was just viewing it as fascinating. Uh, yeah. And again, it's just so beautifully animated. The character designs are so great. And the, I think all, mm-hmm. I mean, the, the backgrounds are so great. It reminded me a lot of Studio Ghibli in that it's almost again, like a heightened reality. Everything looks very much like you probably could see it, but it's just like extra beautiful. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah, I think that it's easy to compare this movie to Grave of the Fireflies because it is yeah, a war movie. I wanted to talk to you about that, yeah. But I actually think it's a little more like Only Yesterday. Yeah, I think it really is a lot, it's much more like Only Yesterday mm-hmm. with the moments of Grave of the Fireflies. Towards the end. Yeah, towards the end. The, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, one key person I think to mention too, Rachel is is the niece, uh, yeah, Harmi, Harmi. Who, who's the daughter of this bitter sister in law, right? But she and and Suzu have a really nice, yeah. And we, I guess we should say we forgot to say we are going to be talking some spoilers. Spoiler, so yeah. This <laughs> film is available on Netflix, so most people yeah. are probably listening or that's where I watched it. it was on Netflix. Yeah, most probably have Netflix, so if you don't want spoilers, <laughs> then yeah. go watch it and then come back because uh, there's just some things we definitely want to talk about. But yeah, I love Harumi. Like, definitely, that felt very. She felt very studio Ghibli for sure. Yeah, so sweet, so wonderful. Yeah. Mischievous, I, uh, but just but just yeah. like a kid, you know. I mean, she's just a kid. Yeah. yeah, I think even Kyoko, I feel like they did enough to kind of flesh out her character. I feel like all of the characters you felt like a family because, like, let's be honest, everybody has that person in the family who kind of gives you a hard time and is difficult yeah. for you to go along with. And it reminded me a lot of uh, I love Hirokuzo Kurida, the director. Mm-hmm. I think he's. It's not that he's underrated because his movies have like tons of them have 100% on Rotten Tomatoes. He's just not well known enough as I think he deserves. He has a wonderful movie called Still Walking that's Uh, beautiful. And it's all about this family that have had this great loss and they're convening together to a memorial for this son that they lost like 10, 10 years before. And they've all kind of carried that baggage. So you've got this family with all these different personalities and all these different things and really great movie it's amazing i love it and i'm so excited to see his um shoplifters it's called his new movie that we got rave reviews out of cons and so he's great but i think his his uh everyday kind of aesthetic is very similar to this movie and the director of this movie i said food is an important part of the film why was that so important for you to share about how she made the recipes and things like that and he says Food for me is a symbol of and representative of everyday life. So that's why it was important for me to focus on that. I really enjoy the explanation of the food. It's very interesting for me. On the other hand, some people question why so food focused in the movie. But then you have to remember in the context of wartime, when you have limited resources, food for even the simplest of dishes ends up being very precious. The changing values about things during war times, I think, is an important aspect of how food plays in the movie. We mm-hmm. actually made the food that Suzu makes and we ate it. We concluded that there was probably a lack of salt at the time, so we didn't use any salt. We really understood the importance of salt after that. And I think that that's really true, that by showing all the effort that had to, because I mean, honestly, how many times have I made rice in my rice cooker and there's just like a little bit left and I'm like, you know, oh well, I'm not going to be able to finish it. Yeah. and uh, Or I'll leave it kind of sitting in there and Every it'll kind of dry out and and here they go to so much effort not only to cook rice but to puff it up so that it feeds more people so yeah. that it, and it was so many meals where that was all they would eat is just rice yeah. and how valuable it is and it's very true when you're in that situation where of scarcity how just prized things come and, I, and so i totally see why he needed to show that it's really cool yeah. and interesting yeah and also, like, it really becomes this way that she is able 
to contribute to the family. And then when she gets injured, it's all the more devastating because that, that thing that she did is lost. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So I thought that was really, really good. And you also see this, it, she's still continuing to draw during this time. And she was looking out at the destroyers and they have the Yama, Yamoto, Yamoto, the world's greatest warship. She's like losing her hair because she's so stressed about these ships and about everything that's happening. And I don't know, you just really get a sense of place and a sense of where she is and what she's going through. There's certain points where the art becomes very controversial, despite it just literally, she's just drawing her life. But that in doing that, that is controversial. Yeah, the military police see her out drawing and think that she's like being a spy. Mm -hmm. I loved the integration of her art into the film. Mm -hmm. Uh, In some scenes, almost became like a living. Yeah. you know, of art too, and just the compliment of the animation and, and how, what a nice job the team did on making that art come to life with, you know, just with the beautiful brush strokes and all those different things yeah. that they did to it. It was really, really nicely done. Yeah, I really like how the bombs almost become almost like fireworks in a way. It's like part of the art. It's yeah. really, really cool. They did partly, at least base it on a manga by Fumio Kono. That's her name. And I guess she was involved to a certain degree with the film and they used her drawings and things like that as well. So but yeah, I really liked how they made sort of art part of her character. Mm-hmm. And the more that she's sort of getting involved with the cooking and getting involved with her art, the more sh- happy she is. And she says to Shusaku, uh, Shaku, she says, I don't want to wake up because I'm happy with who I am today. And he says, choosing to marry you was the best decision of my life. And uh, so then they finally have their first kiss and it's a very, very sweet moment. And it feels that you feel chemistry between them. You feel, yeah. it doesn't feel like icky at all. Yeah, it's really, it's really a nice moment. Mm-hmm. There is a little moment where she thinks she's pregnant. Turns out she's not. It's probably just the stress. But again, you know, one of those moments, like you were saying, kind of like an only yesterday thing, but also like slice of life, you know, just kind of like a, a real life yeah. with the family environment. Because there's a great scene in Only Yesterday where they get to all eat their first pineapple. And it's so triumphant and so exciting and everybody's so happy. <laughs> And that's the kind of thing that you have a lot in this. I mean, I can think of moments like that in our family when just like really silly stuff. Uh, uh, and, and a lot of it does involve food, uh, for instance. So my mom had to go on full bed rest for her pregnancies. And that was very stressful for our family. Oh, yeah, that hard. was very difficult. And uh, <laughs> one time my dad decided... Uh, he got some bar- like barbecued beef that was at the like in the deli or whatever and we got it one day and we liked it and so he was like "Ooh, something they liked and so he came home the next day with 10 pounds <laughs> he's like "Ooh, you guys liked it <laughs> and we we're like why do we don't want it every day <laughs> <He's> like, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, yeah. every family kind of has those moments another yeah. really funny one for my family is uh so while my mom was pregnant with my brother and this was when i was a freshman in high school uh, <laughs> my dad had to be the complete uh manager of the whatever of the garden and my mom had this huge vegetable garden in the backyard and so my dad decided that he was only going to plant <laughs> tomato plants i don't know why (laughs) because he had this like great scheme that we were all going to have like a booth and we were going to sell tomatoes on like the side of the road or something yeah and i was like there's absolutely no way as a freshman in high school that i'm going to be selling tomatoes on the street you know with all my friends driving by that would be so embarrassing like if it's not like we weren't in like dire straits you know whatever yeah and so, but my dad thought it was a great idea. And so he planted 42. Oh, tomatoes. wow. <laughs> you guys had so many tomatoes. So but... many tomatoes. But and we did, and, and we ended up canning, we ended up learning how to can, which was good. And we ended up canning tons of tomatoes. But then finally my, my sister and then my, my younger sister, who was 
I don't know, uh, six or seven at the time. Uh, they, the two of them, they filled up this, this, uh, red wagon with tomatoes and they went around door to door. We're just like, would you like some tomatoes? <laughs> <laughs> but my dad loved it. He was so proud of those tomato plants. And, and uh, I just think every family has those kinds of stories. And that's yeah. what this movie captures. Of course, it's in war, so it's a different dynamic. But I think this movie captures that kind of feeling really well. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So what did you think of her running into Tetsu and this whole sort of sequence involving him? Again, slice of life, you know, that, that uh, at least uh, maybe there's some, some deeper stuff. I'll be in, you know, really interested to get your, your opinion on it. But I just thought, you know, I mean, you do run into people you know, you wonder maybe what could have been. I thought I thought it was an interesting little twist that, that that got put into the to the story. What's your take on it? It's a little melodramatic, but I don't mind it. Like, it just the whole rest of the movie is so authentic that this one part feels a little soapy. But yeah, I mean, <laughs> but sometimes we have soapy that's things. A good point. That's a good point. But but sometimes we have soapy things happen to us, and and so I was fine. Yeah. I was fine with that. I was a little bit unclear of why the whole family and Shu Shu Saku allowed him in there with yeah. her. Yeah, that was one that I just thought, I mean, where's this going? You know, I think it's kind of where I was wondering what what, what was going to really mm-hmm. happen. But then it's then it's over. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know if it. Was, I felt like, oh, is he sort of testing her loyalty to him? Yeah. Uh, and because it was still a pretty new marriage and yeah. she doesn't know exactly what she's going to do i think until the minute that like tetsu makes his move then she immediately kind of repulses back she's kind of mad at shusaku for allowing this all to happen and for permitting it and tetsu says you're surprisingly ordinary it was just kind of interesting i think it's tetsu who says somewhere along the way i derailed from the ordinary so that was kind of interesting yeah uh, Tetsu is is a soldier, his sailor. He ends up leaving, and I don't know it's sort of this moment of truth realization for her. She realizes that she, how committed she really is. And you see more of her painting. You see the bombs as paint during this time, and it really builds up, I think, well to this sort of third part. Because yeah. you know, given the geography and the time period, we all know what's going to happen. You know, yeah. and so there's kind of this impending. I felt this impending doom. I, you know, yeah. I didn't know what was going to happen. It Something. builds up really well. And there's like the scenes in the um, shelter that are really tense. And you see, yeah, those are tense. Yeah. You see her with her visiting her father-in-law who gets injured. Her sister-in-law leaves. Yeah. It's just building up and building up, building up more tension. Yeah really interesting portrayal of it because it made me feel like I was there you know it's like that really must be what that feels like you know when you're you're in a bomb shelter and this is you know this stuff's happening and the house terrifying that's got to be yeah the house ends up getting on fire at one point and she has to throw like wet blankets on the fire and first she just kind of watches it in this sort of stupor and then she throws the blankets on the fire. It's, you know, it's it's just pretty devastating. Yeah. Uh, there's a moment where she is almost killed by a uh, strafing run, is what it's called, I guess. But she's saved by Sh- Sh- Shusaku. Yeah. And she tells him she wants to go back to Hiroshima. She finds out about her brother yeah. who died and her sister comes to visit and uh, she's just has all these conflicted feelings as she's she should go back to her family but is this her new family and she's trying yeah. to figure all that out yeah. and that's definitely come we get up to the most devastating and she even says when her brother dies she says i'm glad my brother is dead he doesn't like, have to be lizzie see this happening or lizzie yeah. anymore and then we get the most devastating part of the movie at least for me. Uh, oh, me she, too. Yeah. She's walking along and the, the after the... The roomy, The little... The roomy, yeah. And it was after the main attack had happened. And she even remembers, she sees that there's a, a bomb that hadn't... Uh, that there, there was a cr- kind of a crater. 
and they're walking along and she has this sort of flashback to remembering i think it was the soldier who said that how she could tell that it was a bomb that hadn't gone off yet so it was like a delay and they're walking along and she's holding her roommate with her right hand and uh before she can change thing before she can run away or do whatever uh, it goes off and uh she wakes up and uh she has not only lost her arm but our big part of her arm but her roommate has died and that is devastating yeah it's devastating and that that sequence is so moving i thought it was so artistically interesting in that the scene, you know, when when she loses her arm or you know most of her arm and and Harumi dies, it's the screen fades to black and then there's just those white. It's almost like it's a chalkboard. Yeah. And uh, stick stick figure drawings are, are, are happening. Yeah. Some very simplistic things, but you know, you know, you you know what's happened and it's really affecting. I I, uh, yeah. I was really impressed with 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 that and how, how emotional it was but but what an interesting artistic choice to make yeah. to demonstrate that you know that that scene it really got me i was oh. crying and so sad. and and then when she wakes up and kyoko is blaming her for the death of harumi uh and just how just devastating and you can't really blame her for feeling that way because that's just one of the steps of grieving you know you yeah and so it's understandable you get angry and she just feels so useless without this arm she says she feels she's distorted that she's lost her value it's just a devastating devastating thing she says i'm distorted like one of my drawings which mm -hmm. is devastating mm -hmm. and she feels like she can't contribute to the family anymore and so she's thinking of going away to hiroshima and leaving the leaving the family to go back to her family and it's really interesting because i remember my mom saying that it was really hard for her to see her married family as her family like when she would talk about my family she was still be talking about her the family she's raised in yeah. for a long time and it took a while you know before you know she had a child and even then like that she really felt like no this new entity is my family and i can only obviously that's going to be much more so when you're dealing with war and things like yeah. that oh, yeah absolutely it's just devastating. She talks about her arm is just irreplaceable. I mean, she really becomes suicidal. Yeah. Right? Like, yeah, she she loses the will to live. And you feel it, you know, as the viewer, you just feel it. You're just devastated. So then it gets closer and closer to, we can feel it coming with all of this, uh, that uh, she, she tells Sh Shasuku that... Uh, that she's going to go to Hiroshima and he tells her, I, I loved walking with you and listening to you talk, which is so sweet. Yeah. So he doesn't want to I'm just thinking, don't go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't yeah Cause we all know, you know, we all know and uh, what's coming and they actually see the, the bomb cloud uh, in Hiroshima just after she cuts her hair and she says my yeah. hair won't get in the way now and that i want to stay strong kind but strong like the people of cure and she says our job is to survive with whatever we have and so she gets this new sort of resolve with this you know just this devastating news and she finds out from sumi that that sumi is the only survivor of her parent of her family her parents her brother had died earlier and Sumi herself is sick from the radiation uh, from the bomb. And so it's, it's really just, it's horrible. You yeah. know, it's a horrible thing. And um, what is really interesting is that so Shusaku ends up going back to the Navy and they find this orphan. What did you think of that whole thing? Well, that's where I was thinking this is great with the fireflies. Just, just almost yeah. like, an abbreviated version and, and, and a little modified version, but because the the child even looked like the little, 
you know, the, the younger sibling in, in mm-hmm. Grave of the Fireflies. Yeah. But I thought it was, I thought it was a really moving and a nice touch. So this child loses her mother and you see it. And here's the, the mother's body is decomposing. And here's this little child who's still alive, but is alone, you know, and, and having to deal with that. And they show it. And, and, uh, so it's one of those things. It's it's hard, clearly. You know, it's 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 very emotional to watch because you just think, oh my goodness, what is going to happen to this poor, to this poor child, and what a what a hor- horrific event. Yeah. But, what did you think about the fact that when they finally do surrender, how angry Suzu is about that? What do you think? Well, I think you know, I mean, I liked it in that because I thought. That's got to be how a lot of these people must have felt. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that were, I mean, here they, they have just, I mean, what a hardship they've been dragged through. But, you know, they felt their side was right. I mean, I don't know how representative it was overall of the population, but I, I would think that, 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 that it's got to be very accurate for at least, you know, for that type of a, a mindset. And maybe, and who knows, I mean, maybe that was most of the country, you know, feeling, yeah. feeling that way. Well, it makes sense when you think about it because they told us that they told them that they were doing it for this, this greater thing. And so when, when that thing is gone and they lost, all of a sudden it makes all of those sacrifices feel less valuable. Like they weren't right. The sacrifices weren't, wasn't worth it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. She says the reason we endured has slipped away. Yeah. And and if they had given up sooner, there would be five of us here and I would have my arm. And uh, so, you know, that's just really, really moving and really interesting. And, and it, it does make sense. And, you know, of course, from our perspective, it's like, Oh, well, wouldn't you want the war to be over if you had suffered all of this much? But, yeah. but you know, we're coming from a different perspective as an observer and also from sort of the, history of the winners too you know so it's a different kind of perspective i mean we've had con- military conflicts as the united states that have not gone perfectly like vietnam or something like that but to come out of uh, world war ii and have lost the war especially a a culture like japan that is very very group oriented it's not as um individualistic as the united states it's just different and so the idea of like the whole group sort of committing to this cause is just different there than it is Mm -hmm. here i think uh even back then yeah so and and again focused this this movie is focused on this group in more of a rural area too so it's not like these people were i mean not that they weren't incredibly bright and and engaged in their lives but they weren't like it wasn't like the scholarly community, you know, and all that, and some yeah. of these other things that 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 uh, will, could possibly view these events through a different lens. So yeah, they were uh, really simple, simple. Yeah, so, I mean, you just wonder how much of the country that was. Probably a lot, you know. Yeah, and then we get to see some of the the after the occupation. I guess the after we see that the Americans are giving them chocolate, and uh, the but the rationing continues, but. There's a uh, there's a scene where they're sort of joyfully eating this soup that's yeah. basically made out of trash. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're so delicious. Isn't it wasn't it? that a great scene because it was almost just like I felt like a sense of relief in a way yeah. too. You know, it was just like they, they turned a corner that even though the food situation is still tough, it's improving. Yeah, and and, and again a. Uh, a way that this brilliant director is bringing food into yeah. into the the storytelling. I mean, you really get a feeling of sort of all that they have been through uh, when you see all the different stages of kind of food. Yeah. And uh, he says, "I felt that it was Suzu and her family's experience of food because we were able to have a firsthand experience of what the food was like and cooking without salt. We wanted to experience what Suzu was actually experiencing, so we made nori." and other foods it was interesting how heavy it was to lift the buckets are full of water how would you end up walking while carrying them some things you can't think about you have to understand it mm-hmm. yeah, and i think that's like the gift of this movie is that it helps you to understand it 
and yeah and understand what these people might have been going through i i think that's what makes it special i agree and in fact it's it's just so aptly titled you know in this corner of the world because it's really you just feel i just felt that i had spent some time in a completely different environment that's so foreign to, to my experience yeah but i just feel like I, I i learned a lot and hopefully gained a better appreciation and some empathy for what these people live through yeah and at the end she hears basically the voices of harumai of tetsu uh, all these people that have been in her life shosuku says i'm so glad you found me in this corner of the world and yeah they've got this you know orphan and uh it's just really it does end on kind of a a moment of calm a peaceful moment despite all that she's been through and and uh yeah it ends on a really hopeful note that that, you know that they're gonna have a nice family life together yeah i mean that, that even though everybody's come through some really horrific stuff including this new there's this this new child and the you know this part of their family now uh that they're going to be able to provide a nice home for her and this is going to be a happy yeah you know a happy thing and then also too because we we know i mean of course we knew that the bomb was going to go off but then we also know about post world war ii japan and that it's thrived really yeah. you know and so you that that i think also brings in some happiness no knowing, knowing the history yeah <laughs> that regard yeah i like he says at the beginning of the journey she goes to cure but almost not by choice it's just how things happen but then at the end she makes a very conscious decision about going to cure so yeah. uh that uh, is really really true and you get to see just her go from being a little girl to really being a, her own woman by the end which is really nice to see yeah. and she finds a way to sew she finds a way to cook and she finds a way to work with her arm and be able to help this little girl so and she you see her passion for all these things kind of coming back it's really cool yeah so that's basically the movie and i don't know i just really really enjoyed it like i said i even liked it better this second time uh because i think i kind of knew what i was going into yeah exactly could kind of help <laughs> yeah is it just a long i mean there's not that many animated movies that are over two hours uh but i i really i really enjoyed it and i love the music it's by a japanese singer named uh coach ringo <laughs> pretty. yeah uh, I thought she did a really good job of building the tension in the way that needed to be, but then also having sort of these peaceful sections yeah. as well. Great music for sure. Last year was such a strong year for anime in general, but also for anime, anime soundtracks. Cause I loved the soundtracks of your name of silent voice and this <laughs> were, both, mm-hmm. were really great. So yeah. it did. He did say it took them six years to make this movie. So, Which, and, you know, and I believe it because it just really has just this feeling of this labor of love. Too. Yeah. Because yeah, the animation is so lovely. It's mm-hmm. so, it's really, it's, it's so well done. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. That, I think, which that, that in and of itself provided lots of enjoyment for me, you know, as far as the viewing goes, just because it yeah. was such a pleasure to watch. Yeah. I mean, if you're comparing something to Takahata, you know, it's really beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> really, really well done. So. Well, very cool. This was really fun to talk about. And I'll put a link down if you want to read my interview with the director. Yeah, you definitely and want to do that. That's, that was a great interview, Rach. Thanks. Uh, it was really a fun one. I really enjoyed talking to him. And uh, so if you get to see this movie, like I said, it's on Netflix. So yeah. check it out. Let us know what you think. And uh, w- next month, we are actually, it's, I don't really know how obscure it is, but we're just giving a little christmas present to all of you guys and we are going to be talking about mickey's christmas carol next month <laughs> and uh, that one's going to be really fun to talk about yeah i'm excited it's, i haven't watched it for a really long time so I'm, oh. I'm, excited, I'm excited to revisit it perfect i really enjoy it it's very unique even the movies that are about our fab five in uh in disney like mickey and the beanstalk it's still mickey 
And it's the only movie I can think of where they actually are playing other characters. Yeah, other characters that not other than the yeah. themselves. Yeah. <laughs> so there's Cratchit and, yeah. and a Goofy is Marley and stuff like that. It's really quite fun and quite scary for our little kids Yeah, uh, in certain sequences. So anyway, that's what we're going to do next month for Obscure Animation. And uh, we have two episodes of Talking Disney this month. And uh, we already did our episode on wreck Ralph. And then we'll be talking about Ralph Breaks the Internet. So it'll be a lot of fun. And uh, thanks so much for joining me this whole year to talk about uh, talk well, about obscure animation. Fun. Thank you, Rachel, for again for the invitation and for introducing me to some really great animated films. I've really I've 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 learned a lot. I've really enjoyed it. Oh, me you. too. Uh, so, how can people find you? I'm on Twitter at Stanford Clark, and also I have a movie blog, which is moviespastandpresent.com. Great. And I'll have that all down in the description section. And you can follow me at Rachel's Reviews, all over social media and on iTunes and on YouTube. And if you could put your reviews for the podcast on iTunes, it really helps us out. We really appreciate it. And um, thanks again. And we'll talk, uh, talk again next month. Bye.